Hello, BookTube. Sorry once again for the obnoxious background noise. Not only the construction sound, where the across the street, the beautiful, peaceful field where I once walked my geriatric babies, uh, is being ripped up and turned into housing units, uh, but also directly in front of my house, where we now have the addition of jackhammers, uh, where a work crew is working on a gas main that they have come back to for years in this exact same spot, three feet by three feet, which tells me uh, two things. One, they don't know what they're doing. And two, I am certainly going to die in this house. <laughs> and both of those things are a little frustrating. <laughs> uh, but I thought if anything will cure that, it will be a mail hall. And, I, you know, it, was, it occurred to me the other day that there's been a little bit of a gap <laughs> since we did one. So let's do one. <laughs> right, we'll start with this. What have we here? This is, okay, it's a thriller from Restless Books, from a Mexican master. It's called Milena, or the Most Beautiful Femur in the World, by Jorge Zepeda Patterson. Oh. Okay, all right. Uh, I cannot stand uh, title, comma, or titles. I can't stand that. It wasn't, it wasn't Herman Melville's intention to do that with Moby Dick, and it shouldn't ever be anybody's intention. But uh, uh, let's see here. The title character is a woman kidnapped from her Croatian village and sold to a ring of international sex traffickers with ties to the highest rungs of military and political power. The novel doesn't shy away from portraying the horrors of forced prostitution, but it would be imprecise to call Milena a victim. She resists, and when she sees an opportunity to leverage her liaisons with the powerful, she does so forcefully. There's much more to the story. See the enclosed press release for details. And the author is a well-known journalist in Mexico who th spent three years chronicling its politics, crime, and corruption before turning his expertise in storytelling gifts to fiction with Milena, which I guess is his debut novel. Um... Uh, Sincerely hoping that he didn't write this press release, since if he's had decades of experience in political reporting in Mexico, he knows that not only is it a redundancy to use a f the phrase forced prostitution, but it's actually incredibly damaging <laughs> to, to the women involved uh, to do that. It, because in the minds of troglodytes, it will immediately raise an alternative uh, that doesn't exist, that isn't true. <laughs> anyway, I'm already ranting. One book out of the gate. That's bad. That's what jackhammers will do to you. <laughs> uh, uh, so this comes out. Uh, do we have a... Yeah, let's, let's consult the aforementioned press release. Uh, this uh, uh, comes out in a week. Uh, and is it Jorge Zepeda Patterson? Uh, is he... Okay, yes. So this is translated in 2017, but it came out in 2014 in Mexico. Okay. All right, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, this next thing here. Get an odd vibe off it. Uh, let's see. Ooh, vibe gets even odder. This looks handmade. This looks hand done. Oh, and it is hand done. Okay. Oh, great. All right. Uh, uh, okay. This is this is a self-published novel, a self-published historical novel. Uh, by an author who does them right, who does them well. So this is a self-published historical novel I can actually recommend to you. Uh, this is Fatal Rivalry by Mercedes Rochelle. It's part three of The Last Great Saxon Earls. And uh, The Last Great Saxon Earls, that phrase, uh, will tell those of you who are historically minded what we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'll read this anyway here because it's... Uh, uh, let's see here. In 1066, the rivalry between two brothers brought England to its knees. When Duke William of Normandy landed at Pevesney in September 28th, no one was there to resist him. King Harold Godwinson was in the north, fighting his brother Tostig in a fierce Viking invasion. How could this have happened? Why would Tostig turn traitor to wreak revenge on his brother? Uh, and uh, this is... a. a the latest book in a series, and I've read I've read the predecessors, and 
I recommend them highly. This is fruitful grounds for historical fiction, but you'd be amazed how many, or maybe you wouldn't be amazed, how many historical novelists, self-published historical novels, will situate their novel in a time period where you would think, okay, uh, epic action, legitimate turning point in Western history, outsized personalities, there's no way you can go wrong, and then go wrong. <laughs> this author does not. So, uh, uh, in addition to whatever I will do with it in terms of reviewing, uh, allow me to make a little plug. <laughs> if you want to do an author, a self-published indie author, a good turn, and if you're looking for good, involving historical fiction, and if the time period interests you, go to Amazon or wherever you want to go and download the book. Uh, you won't be sorry. Uh, and uh, then we get something from Yale University Press. Very small. Could be a slim volume of poetry. I'm not sure I can take those with a uh, gas leak going on. <laughs> oh, maybe that's the exact circumstance in which to enjoy it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, oh, it's not a slim volume of poetry. It's their catalog. <laughs> it's their fall catalog. Oh, my. Oh. <laughs> so, all right. So when you get something like this, you immediately look for the big booming things, the things that jump right out, the things that are, you know, that are not run of the mill. Not that, not to say that Yale ever does anything that's run of the mill, but the things that jump right out. Like, for instance, uh, well, what do we got here? Okay. <laughs> right on schedule. Uh, Stephen Mitchell translating Beowulf. Uh, there you go. <laughs> that will certainly do it. Uh, oh, but look at all this good stuff. Oh, my. A new translation of the New Testament. Uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> a new history of the stormtroopers, of Hitler's stormtroopers. <laughs> oh, I am just going to pour through this. But uh, So that's the first thing that I do uh, when I get something like this. The first thing I do is look at the things that, that pop out, things that are really big. You look at them and you think, okay, that's going to get reviewed everywhere. A new translation of Beowulf is going to get reviewed everywhere. Uh, there's a new 400 page biography of Brutus uh, that's interesting okay so you look through here you look at a catalog like this and you try to I love to to, uh, to play the ponies <laughs> I love to, to go through something like this and uh, try to pick out which books are actually going to get reviewed widely and which ones aren't now, it's, it's, it's a crapshoot, and, you know, there's only so much space. And one of the ways that used to be, that used to make that prediction very easy uh, is now gone. Uh, Bob Silvers is gone from the New York Review of Books. He, he died. Uh, and when he was alive for 53 years, you could predict what the New York Review of Books would do with a fair degree of accuracy if you'd been reading it right from the beginning. Uh, and... That's no, no longer completely true. I mean, the, the journal has, I'm sure, lots of pieces in hand, uh, but uh, it's, it's, an, it's an open guess now what kind of shape it will take. Uh, that's, that's one of the things you do, is you go through and you try to pick out uh, what, will, what will get attention. Uh, but then another thing that I do, I won't hold up long here because we've got lots of books to do, but another thing that I do... Uh, you're probably going to see this coming, <laughs> is go to the back where the paperbacks are and look for blurbs. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. For instance, Pax Romana. I, I reviewed that. Didn't get a blurb. Uh, Chris Wickham's Medieval Europe. I reviewed that. Ooh, didn't get a blurb. Oh, this is looking boring. <laughs> sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Oh, there's a new cover for Clive James's Play All... His, his book about uh, binge-watching TV, such a good book. It's coming out in paperback. That's good. That's very good. Uh, he, he received a couple of severe illness diagnoses and was for his whole life a critic and was all of a sudden faced with a slightly invalid situation in his life where he, he wasn't really up to the kind of sustained, really concentrated critical writing but he couldn't turn it off. <laughs> he found himself watching all sorts of stuff on Netflix and whatnot and decided, well, if I'm doing this, I might as well write about it. That's classic, classic Clive James. <laughs> uh, 
but anyway, let's, uh, let's, I, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't bedevil this too much. I just want to see if, for instance, I got any blurbs <laughs> this time around. And, you know, this isn't all of it, but, uh, but, like, Hitler soldiers, uh, no blurb. The first victory, no blurb. <laughs> Nelson's wake, no blurb. And that's, a, that's a little disturbing because, uh, I, I do open letters monthly, of course, but I also do the Christian Science Monitor. This should be in time for that. So you would think uh, that some of them would be in here, but but no. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, oh, God, it goes on forever and ever. All right, all right well, let's, let's and, and the, the order sheets. All right, so very good. That will almost certainly be the highlight of this for me, but but not for you. So let's, uh, let's keep going. Let's do this next one here. Uh, Oh, the Yale catalog. Mm. Viewed more Yale University Press books than anyone on earth, uh, and I never get tired of it. Uh, okay, the next one is fiction. It is Red Light Run by Baird Harper, who, uh, his fiction has appeared in Glimmer Train, Tin House, Story Quarterly, and the Chicago Tribune. His stories have been anthologized in Best American Voices, 40 Years of Cut Bank, and New Stories of the Midwest, 2016. He teaches writing at Loyola University and the University of Chicago. Um, okay, up until that last line about teaching at the University of Chicago and Loyola, I would have assumed that he was a dude bro in his early 30s. But I, I can't imagine. Maybe he's a, maybe he's a wonderkin dude bro. <laughs> How's that for a, a deadly combo? <laughs> uh, so let's see here. It's linked stories. Uh Wicklow, Illinois, is a small town in post-recession decay, teeming with secrets and old rivalries. On the day Hartley Nolan is supposed to be released from prison after killing Sonia Sen in the worst accident anyone can remember, we're pulled into the inner lives and pasts of Sonia Hartley and a host of memorable characters. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is due uh, in early August. I am not a big fan of linked stories. They, are, they almost always strike me as the author being lazy. Uh, but... I've also seen them done well, so uh, we'll certainly give it a try. Uh, especially since the author's name is Baird. <laughs> huh. well, let's see what this next one is. Feels heavy. Oh, look at that. All right, speak of the devil. This is the uh, this is a nice uh, paperback of the Middle Ages by by Johannes Fried. Uh, this a uh, very good book about a comprehensive history of the middle ages very nice uh okay so this comes out in in mid-may great i didn't i didn't anticipate that this would get a paperback i never i never can tell a thousand page scholarly history of something I, I never can tell if it's going to get a paperback or if that's you know part of the whole thing uh and see this has a, a long blurb on the back from the new york review of books but who knows in a year when all of the commission pieces have, have played out and presumably somebody is in charge. Just, just, they, the, the, the NYRB can't bring itself to put someone in Bob Silver's place, and I don't blame them. Uh, presumably, none of that will still be true in a year. In a year, the place will be, you know, to use the old phrase, under new management. And who knows what the emphasis will be? I mean, th there's nothing wrong with that. Literary journals come to reflect their editors. In a, in a perfectly ideal world, that might not be true, but it does happen, and it's sometimes a very good thing. I mean, it, depending on on the editor. <laughs> so, I have a can candidates in mind. I think that the New York Review of Books would works perfectly when there are two people in charge, balancing each other, and working as a team so they don't cross wires in terms of, you know, who they're encouraging or who they're paying or whatnot. Uh, and I know some teams that would do a very good job, uh, but who knows what will happen. <laughs> I, I also know a couple of individual people who would do a very good job <laughs> in that role. Uh, uh, but you can never, you can never predict. Uh, oh, oh, fantastic. Okay, this is a, this is a, a second copy. Uh, it's due in early May. It's Carol Birkin's A Sovereign People, The Crises of 1790s and the Birth of American Nationalism. Uh, and let me, uh, see what, oh my, oh goodness. Well, okay, Carol Burke and is, is, 
he's aging just like the rest of us. <laughs> that's, wow, that's that's interesting. Uh, should, uh, uh, presidential professor of history emerita at Baruch College, and the Graduate Center at uh, CUNY, and the author of many acclaimed books, and they're all wonderful. She's a fantastic writer. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun to read. I actually have a finished copy already, but I haven't got to it, so I'm just I'm glad to have it. Uh, and then this, this big thin thing. Uh, what is this? Can't be on the catalog. I couldn't be so lucky. <laughs> uh, oh, oh, good. Okay, this is uh, uh, Magnetic City, a walking companion to New York by Justin Davidson, who's the architecture critic for New York Magazine. I mean, for those of you, I don't know how many of you, we really ought to have a discussion about what kinds of periodicals people read. Uh, but I used to read New York Magazine faithfully, and he, his stuff is really good. Uh, so when I knew that this was coming out, where he just where he takes you all around the living walkability of New York City, that's there's talk about the perfect guide for the perfect subject. Uh, and I, I miss I miss reading New York Magazine. It was one of the one of the many magazines that I called uh, after the the election in 2016. So I don't get it anymore. I, occasionally I'll pass a newsstand or newsstand section of a bookstore and I'll see a cover that looks very enticing but I know that the first six stories I, are going to be things that are only going to enrage me so I <laughs> I don't do it very very strange feeling uh, but I on the on the plus side I am getting to know a whole bunch of new periodicals things that I never subscribed to before uh, like architectural digest uh, better homes and gardens coastal living stuff like that that I uh, a, a bunch of birding magazines, stuff stuff that I might have done once or twice over the decades if I got a really sweet deal on a subscription, but now I get them all. And I get to explore oh, Condé Nast Traveler, big deluxe magazine, Condé Nast Traveler. Oh, so wonderful. <laughs> but anyway, oh, we get to this last one here. This is the, this is the last one. This somewhat scattershot mail haul. Uh, with these cardboard things that you have to dismantle in order to uh, in order to do anything with them. Even once you've opened them, you have to tear them apart if you're going to dispose of them. <laughs> it's very annoying. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, fantastic. Uh, okay, this is The Road to Camelot in a finished copy uh, by Tom Oliphant and Curtis Wilkie, who both both veterans of the Boston Globe. Uh, and it's a story, it's the story of of John F. Kennedy, there you go, uh, um, plotting for a long time and running for president. And uh, I'm reviewing it for the Christian Science Monitor. I thought it was, it's just fantastic. Uh, I'm very glad to have a finished copy, though, because I've been, I've been working off uh, a galley. <laughs> just it's a, a slight exaggeration. I haven't actually let the authors get in a word in it. <laughs> <laughs> but now that I have the finished copy, I'm starting to feel a little guilty about that. So maybe I'll, you know, mention the book. <laughs> this, this is, uh, this is one of those subjects where, uh, no offense to them, but there's, they're not going to know anything more about the subject than I do. So uh, the the whole review is going to be, it, it's telling readers the story. And that can sometimes get me carried away. <laughs> that's bad. That's not fair. That that's bad. So, uh, what I I want to tell my readers the story. It's an incredible story. And uh, but I, I also want to link it with the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> this will be my reminder to do that. So we have uh, the road to Camelot, and then we have Magnetic City, a walking guide to New York. Wonderful. Then a Sovereign People by Carol Birkin. Uh, solid work of American of colonial era American history. And then uh, the Middle Ages in a paperback. No idea this was coming. That's wonderful. Uh, and then a little fiction, inter interlinked stories. This is uh, what was it called again? Red Light Run, uh, the Yale catalog, which I will be sequestering myself with <laughs> in no time at all. Uh, Fatal Rivalry by Mercedes Rochelle. Go and look it up. If it seems of interest to you, I'm sure it's not going to be that expensive. Go ahead and buy it. You'll be you'll be glad you did. Uh, and if you like it, you'll love the rest of the series. So you'll have an author to follow. That's and uh, Milena, or the most beautiful femur in the world. 
uh, Mexican thriller. So there you go. Uh, so we've got uh, the whole booktube smorgasbord here. We've got crappy lighting and I assume crappy audio. I'm assuming you've heard every word they've been doing out there. Every every single backhoe <laughs> beeping. <laughs> Who knows how long it's going to last. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll, I'll go for now and I'll see you soon, booktube. Thank you.